meet you guys. I'm Thomas Quinn. And uh, I was asked to come by and uh, state my background, qualifications, what inspired me to run, that, that stuff we're doing for office. Are you guys politically involved much? That's kind of a joke, right? <laughs> I mean, it depends on whether the, any candidate is viable considering they have a Trump color. Yeah. yeah, no, I hear you. I, I kind of stopped paying attention to the national thing. Because when you run for office, you're swamped anyway. With your own, own campaign issues and, uh, and functions. But yeah, uh, I thought rather than just running my tongue on just political stuff, I might, I might focus more on my background because it's more interesting. So I, I grew up at incredibly poor and very unusually poor. I'm one of eight children growing up. My parents scarcely worked my entire life. And my parents joined a small religious sect back in the 70s. Some would refer to it as a cult, but it wasn't. It was really friendly. There's no, no threat there. It's just unorthodox. So my parents met in this group. And they married without approval, and I was brought up as a bastard child in this small religious group. And so when I would go to church functions, they wouldn't let me take pictures with the other kids because I was a bastard. You know, so we all have our unique childhood experiences, but something that really dug into me deep was the fact that whenever I earn some kind of outcome, be it monetarily, my parents would always take it for the, for the greater good of the family needs. So by the time I was five, I wrapped roses. My parents had a flower business for a couple years and made a good income. They had a couple six-figure year and they gave away was tied to the church to appease them. And for the rest, they just spent their time in the library. Okay, have your parents ever done that? Oh, come on. <laughs> no, no. Library's good. I'm sure they good. But, um, so from the time I was five, I'm wrapping roses. By the time I'm 11, I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get paper out before going to school. And then uh, by the time I'm 15, I start my own business. I do odd jobs. I do trench work. I pick blueberries on a blueberry farm. I dig trenches, like I mentioned, that part. I do lawn care, what have you, anything that can scrounge a few dollars. And I feel pretty successful. I you know as a 15-year-old kid, you're making a couple grand a month. You think you're pretty hot stuff, right? <laughs> but every time I make more money is every time my parents find a need for the family. So they would subscribe a new, you know, uh, chore for me. So my chore would be to find more money to pay for laundry and go to laundromat and do laundry. Or I have to uh, suddenly pay for toiletries, you know. And then my <laughs> brothers would have their own little chores. So it's like, right? And this all feels well and good. And so my, my point here is I'm Republican because I hate socialism or, or pseudo-socialism, if you will. Because in socialism, every time that I found myself doing something for the greater good, I felt really good about it. But over the course of the years, I became more and more bitter and more and more reserved. And, and ultimately, all the siblings as we grew older we became apathetic or we just fled the situation. And that's, that's what a lot of socialist countries happen. All the people just flee the country because they're not getting the rewards for what they're fighting for. And it's not always money. It's, it's whatever your ambition may be. And they may just pursue other things that don't have so much structure around them. So by the time I'm 15, my parents decide they found laissez-faire capitalism. They, they, they see Milton Freeman. You guys know Milton Freeman? He's, he's a worthy he's a worthy pursuit. He was a professor out in Chicago. He's a award-winning economic, economics professor he's since passed. And uh, so my parents decided that we're not going to live on welfare anymore because that's all we've ever done. We've lived off the state. And we moved to Hawaii because my older brother joined the Navy and he's been saving $17,000 for the last four years while being stationed in Hawaii. So we all fly out there, turn into a new leaf, and we're going to do great things, and my parents never work. <laughs> And uh, so we, we find out, all of us kids making minimum wage, what are we going to do? I mean, my parents are realizing the fact that if we do campgrounds, it's a lot cheaper, and we can just get storage facilities because of the, the dime a dozen out there. So we live on these campgrounds, and me and I have two brothers in the military, one in the National Guard and one just out of the Navy and the National Guard. We camp on military bases. There's Bellows Beach and there's the Marine Base. Go for a month here, and two weeks every week. That's the that's the limit they they have. Anyone camp out? Who likes camping? Come on, 
Yeah, this is the best way to be homeless, honest to God. <laughs> Beach of Hawaii, it's really not that bad. So, yeah, we're doing this situation. We become the epitome of squatters because we start having furniture out there. <laughs> but you know, this is the first time in my life I'm not on welfare and I feel really good about myself because every time growing up we go to the store and we get them food stamp cash, there's, there's a certain level of embarrassment and you just want to turn away and just not pay attention. Not to mention you're always wearing ratty clothes that don't quite fit you quite well. So we may be in this peculiar, unusual situation, but I feel very good about myself. And I can't tell anyone because you, you can't talk about that. <laughs> the sad thing is 9-11 happens. Do you guys remember where you were on 9-11? Yep. Or where were you at 9-11? Anyone, come on. Seventh grade class? Oh, yeah. I was in sixth grade class. I was 12 at the time. I was walking to school, and literally, like, every kid was like, did you hear about the Twin Towers coming down? I'm like, what? And that's all they were talking about. Then I came home, my mom was like, yeah, dad on the television. It's like, on literally every channel. I was like, <laughs> And it was, wasn't it? You know, it's um, absolutely true. And, you know, it happened just a few days ago, so I get this big flashback, and I'm just kind of revisiting this this moment, and it's still kind of circling in my mind. But that's it. You know, the whole country was unified. You know, it wasn't about party politics. It was just this uh, one cohesive unit, just heartfelt for the nation. You watch TV and you see people jumping off the towers, and it's just heart, it's heart wrenching. You know, but that day too, I was. You know, we, we had to be kicked out of the, the marine base, and so I was homeless on top of being homeless on that day. But the irony is it had nothing to do with me. You know, it was a situation. And so we're all, we're all, we have these unique lives and we have these unique experiences, but at the end of the day, we're just people and we share, we share what we have. And that's what I'm trying to do here, so. So in, in all this foundation, all this background, I want to really create the fact that I really desired to go beyond my childhood. I had no, I had no expectation of being poor. It was not going to happen. I was going to be a success. So we moved to Missouri, because Missouri's awesome, right? <laughs> Best state ever. It's gonna be one way or the other. May I ask, what, why come to Missouri? Yeah, my parents are from Nebraska originally. They wanted to be in the Midwest, but they didn't want to be too close to their, to their family because of family conversation, they get attacked too much. Okay. <laughs> and Missouri's awesome. You know, Missouri's where it's at. It's the only state where it can be sunny one moment and then hail the next. It's true. Yeah, it's so true. <coughs> so we moved to Missouri, and uh, the cost of living is low. It has four seasons, but they're moderate. It's got the best of all the worlds. And um, I decide it doesn't matter where I work, it doesn't matter how much I make, it, it doesn't matter. It's all going to go away. So what I care about is what's going to attribute interest for me while I can be altru altruistically helping the family. And um, I decided pizza, because that's walking distance, and my god, I love Papa John's pizza. So I start getting a job there and become the youngest general store manager of the franchise, some 30 plus stores, and I never quite could figure it out, but I think I was the youngest in the company nationwide. Right. Again, I feel like I'm this great success, I'm making $30,000 a year plus bonuses, and it's really empty after six months, because it's not really what my heart wants. And every time I make more money, the more money my parents take, and they often squander because it's people who can't manage money and don't manage money, and they just they waste it. So I realized I've had my fill. I've had my 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 I've had my epitome of socialist, altruistic, you know, uh, experiences, and I'm going to go away. And so my parents set up an arranged marriage, so to speak, because they're devoutly uh, religious, and they hooked me up with this girl in the Philippines who we've been talking for years. And so I decided I'm going to go out there and experience that. Maybe maybe this thing will work out. I go to the Philippines and I become an English teacher. Who wants to be a teacher? Teaching's awesome. <laughs> this man's smart. Yeah, he's got it right. I've seen both sides. Huh? I've seen both sides. I've been in a class where students have made teacher cry. Yeah, and when I started out there, I did That's ESL. happened in this class. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, see me in the 10 minutes after this class. But I mean, like, literally because they were <coughs> intentionally cruel to her. Yeah, well, you know, things happen. I started out in the ESL, English was a second language, because you have Koreans who have the highest graduation rate in the world, and the only way for them to advance themselves is to 
have a niche greater than their competition. So supply and demand issue. And what they do is they go to the Philippines and these other third world countries for a cheap English education to bump their resume. So I started doing one-on-ones and one-on-threes. And I'll tell you what, that's the worst kind of teaching. This man, he's got something more for me. But as I'm in the Philippines, I, I take over a review center. I have the number one English review, review center for pass rate in the country. Now, granted, the Philippines, their American dream, so to speak, is to go to America, earn money, send it back, and build a house, and be established. Or go to New Zealand or England or someplace. What they do is they become nursing graduates, probably, so they can get visas brought. But they have to pass English. So it's a big business. I did pretty well per capita. So per capita, my students did well. That's what I was very happy for. So I became the English teacher of Papa John's. I became an English teacher with no credentials. <laughs> and became the number one guy in the country. My wife and I, at the time, now we had kids, and my, my family is anxious to see my, my kin, my young, my, my kids. So they, they force us to process papers by paying every fee possible in the process. We come to the States during the height of the recession. And next thing I know, I'm on every social work program available because I can't find a job. My economy's shot, my mentality's worse. And next thing I know, I, I find out I'm starting all over again in uniform sales. You guys ever go to a Walmart and see a mask at the entryway or can shops that get uniforms? Uniform service providers provide those. It's a rental service. So I would go out and I'd go out and get contracts. I would service them. And I would Handle the quality control and retention. Around what year, what time was this again, I guess? Oh gosh, we're jumping around, aren't we? Um, 2011? Okay. 10. Okay. Um, <laughs> Somewhere Somewhere in <laughs> but our market center became the number one in the country for the company. We did $8 million a year, and our, our market center saved $200,000 a year. I started out working in production, and I redesigned a redistribution center for the production department, saved two hours of production labor a day. I quickly jumped into the route sales. So everything I do, I try and do well, and I'm just a good laborer. And I hope you guys are too, because whenever you pursue things, you always pursue a purpose, or don't pursue it all. But uh, here's the crux of the matter. You know, you, you, you're living your life, you're trying to do your thing, but if things surround you that that kind of affect your life, and politics is one of those things. So I'm really happy to see that people care. Politics really does affect everyone, and local politics affects everyone more than they realize. Everyone pays attention to the national thing, right? You're all, you're all watching Trump and Hillary, right? But there's just as much stuff going on locally. So moving to the next question, I'm probably way over my time here. No, you're fine. But Go ahead. what inspired you to run? So we have Ferguson, right? I have sister-in-laws. They got their associates here at OTC or Drury or someplace years ago. And Jay Nixon was out there trumping his horn everywhere. <coughs> Politicking, that's what you do. And uh, <coughs> trumping my horn. <laughs> but when Ferguson happens, all the politicians, they were non-existent. So I, I, for personally, I, I kind of felt it was, it was not, I'm trying not to be I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. Uh, I, I, would you just summarize quickly when you're referring to Ferguson, just for anybody who might not be familiar with what you're referencing? So up in St. Louis area, Ferguson, you have Black Lives Matter uh, origins, where this uh, young black individual had a confrontation with a police officer and he ended up dying. And no matter how you uh, look at it, it ended in riots and some stores and flames, a lot of looting and mismanagement and the bite and the afterproduct of the situation. Heavy police militarization. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, yeah, Hold it was a mess. It was. Go ahead, Tom. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm upset locally as a Missourian about being you know, a national embarrassment with Ferguson, and then the zoo happens. We have uh, so much polarization. And, and classes and issues with that. And then our state economy is really bad. So I'm trying to run, run this business and we have the growing sales, but it's so difficult because we're 47 in job growth of all states. And our national economy is not doing too hot. It's growing, it's getting better, but it's, just, it, it's really just not doing well. But the kicker is education. I have five kids. Me and my wife, we, we love each other very much. <laughs> I'm getting up. 
So, education in the state is not very good, particularly Springfield. If you go to Nixa, Willard, Ozark, they perform well, but within Springfield proper, we don't have a very good rated school system by and large. And so my wife decided to homeschool. For a one household income, we, we decided to struggle in, in that respect for the greater good of our kids because we care about our kids' future. So, to me, it, it, it reads a lot, set what equal. You know, we spend $9,000 a year per child in this region. And yet they can't figure it out. And grand nine thousand dollars sounds like a lot. It's not in some ways, and it's, it's a lot in others. But my nephews up in St. Louis County, those kids get nineteen thousand dollars per year per head. And uh, to me, it seems a bit top heavy with the funding, superintendents and whatnot. But um, plumbing isn't fixed in a lot of those schools up there. So to me, it screams a lot of mismanagement and a lot of top-down federal legislation on the state. And as a Republican, I think that local is better. And I think that the teacher's boards, and the student teacher and all that situation can, can affect better outcomes locally than someone in DC. So I'm upset about everything. But I'm too busy, I work 80 hours a week, I'm a blue collar guy, right now I drive a truck, right? So I decided I'm just gonna fix my driveway. Who likes their driveway? Oh come on, you think about it every day. <laughs> I know you do. You sleep about it. It's on your mind all the time. Well, mine was. <laughs> you pick these little things, right? I drive home every day, and it's just an eyesore for me. I got dirt more than gravel. The gravel sinks, the dirt comes up. And so I think, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and set aside time and work on my driveway. And there's a purpose to the story. So I YouTube ideas because I'm on a budget. I find out that you can use tires as filler as an alternative to gravel. And I like the ecology. I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a nature freak in a lot of ways. And uh, yeah, very smooth. <laughs> so you cut off the sidewalls, you fill it with more tire, and you get a big mass, big brick of tire. You lay it in the earth, it becomes a foundation. You can throw asphalt on top, is what the video says on YouTube. It's a secure video. And I thought, God, that's interesting. I can throw gravel on top, and my gravel won't sink, the earth won't come up, everything will be good, it'll last forever. I call the city to seek approval to work my own driveway, and they say, oh my God, how cool are you? You're saving the environment, you're not widening the driveway, you're not laying concrete, which requires an engineer, you're not cutting the sidewalk, we wish you the best, no permit required. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool, right? Yeah? Yeah, this is cool. Then I called the tire shops, and I said, what do I gotta do to get some tires? And they said, you can come by and take all the tires you want. There's two ways to get rid of tires in Missouri. You cut off the sidewalls, which is what I want, right? It categorizes a different waste product, and they go to the landfill two miles north. So I'm going to take tires that go on the earth, and I put them in the earth. Everyone's going to be happy. Battery, you pay three bucks a tire for recycling, and two of the three recycling facilities in Missouri are under indictment for bad process because they take money and don't do it right. Right. So I start my project. I'm taking away too long. Okay. I'll give you a heads up on work. Okay. All right. So. I start, I'm working 80 hours a week, and I start digging up my driveway on the weekend. I want to inculcate the fact that my kids work ethic, consistency, they're the Netflix generation, everything's just instant, right? So I take a wheelbarrow shovel, and I start filling the backyard with earth, because it's sloped. And then the city freaks out, because I start collecting tires, because tires are evil. Tires are bad. We can't have tires. No. <laughs> so I get a construction violation, a mosquito violation, a on this violation of the course of summary, four violations, and um, a whole lot of mosquito violations. I was curious about that too. Mosquito <laughs> violation. Yeah, if you have water puddles, it attracts mosquitoes. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, my uncle died from a mosquito bite in the Philippines. He got dengue and it killed him. So I mean, it's not like I didn't respect it, I didn't acknowledge it, but I had the sidewalls cut off, water drains was good, life was happy. They drop it every time I contest. So as the summer's come to a close, I've got this dug up driveway. I got tires up to my uh, ankle, all neatly packed. And I, and I spend $1,000 for creek rock. And as it's hauling in that same day, the city comes by and stakes a notice on my lawn. And they say, you have 16 days to move these tires or face penalties. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a bit flustered. I called the complaint, somewhat civil. 
comparison. <laughs> and I said, this is outrageous. And they said, no, 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 no. If you don't comply, we'll press charges. 